Welcome to the final episode of Series 44, everyone. We have a great discussion episode ready for you soon, but first, some announcements. First off, there are just a few days left to back Haunted Hill Academy on Kickstarter, and they need your help to fund. Please check out the show notes um, if you haven't yet, and let's see if we can get them to the finish line. If you want to hear more about it before you back, we have a spotlight episode with uh, creator Jeffrey Hayes, which was a ton of fun. Mm -hmm. um, we put that out earlier in the month. It was it was a blast creating those characters. Um, he specifically made Necromancer and Magical Girl. Uh, just for us. Yeah, categories just for us. Um, Nate has listened to that episode like three times and keeps asking me when the game comes out. Mm -hmm. um, so please, you know what, everyone? Don't disappoint Nate. Yeah, do it for Nate. Do it for Nate. I mean, also yeah. do it for do it for Jeffrey because it, it was, you know, a very cool game. Yeah. Um, but I, I think fans of our show will find a lot there. It's also <laughs> made for two players, but has an option for more. Um, mm -hmm. But I feel like it's hard to find fun two-player games, so I'm actually looking forward to that part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so check out the link in our show notes and please help that game fund. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, another Kickstarter that just opened up is the Questlandia RPG, uh, updated and expanded uh, by the One Shot Network's very own Hannah and Evan, uh, hosts of the Design Doc podcast. Um, after years of work, they are finally bringing this to fruition, and it's really great to see how far the game has come uh, from its early days. Uh, we will have a link to that one also in the show notes. Yes, and I actually saw Hannah posted this morning um, that she's got to have some dental surgery. And so mm -hmm. if you back, um, you can own like 2% of one of her teeth if you want. Yep. Um, so, <laughs> you know, if you're into... <laughs> Is that thing that can happen? <laughs> yeah, if you're into owning uh, teeth, you know, you can... Uh-huh. You can be the proud owner of 2% of one of Hannah's teeth. Exactly. And if you really go all out, uh, you could make that 100%. Uh, you could. <laughs> <laughs> if you really wanted to. If you to. really wanted. Um, next up, a Catacon event registration is live for everyone. Ryan Ooh. and I are both going to be there officially. It is officially official two weeks yeah. away. I think I have my life sorted out that I can really go. It wasn't for sure until like two days ago. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, we'll be there. We both have some events planned, so please check those out. I will be running Arium Create uh, for two sessions that weekend. I think they are already filled, but you can yeah. obviously get on the wait list in case somebody cancels. Mm -hmm. um, it is an awesome world building game. It was one of the Ennies nominees this year that I just fell in love with. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ryan has two games of Chimera planned. Um, I don't know if you still have spots or not. It's a waiting uh, yeah, list. I, I, I think I've got a waiting list for one of them. Uh, and one of them has one slot open as of the time of this recording. Yeah. Um, and then you have some of the Our Final Gathering. Uh, you have one game of that as well, which, yeah. by the way, dear friends, if you want to know what that game is about, uh, there is a bonus episode in the One Shot Secret Archive of us mm -hmm. trying that out with Tracy Barnett. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're mostly sold out of things, but you can always get on the wait list. But fear not. We have a live panel we that we panel. are doing. I know that has plenty of spots left uh, Saturday at 10 a.m. for two hours. Mm -hmm. We are going to be creating random characters with the audience where we have uh, everybody in the audience roll on random tables and then we try and make it make sense. Yep. Um, it was so much fun last time. I know that uh, the 2019 panel is recorded and it's in our feed somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so you can certainly check that out as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I'm excited for that. Uh, bring your dice, people, because uh, there will be a lot of rolling. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we'll we'll get everybody involved in our shenanigans. Yeah, it was so much fun last time. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be bringing dice. I am going to start scouring my books to find out what random tables we can roll on. Absolutely. But it's going to be great. It's going to be and great. And I, th I believe we still have the ones from last year. So, yes. Uh, yeah, we'll we rolled on some... Um, uh, Palladium tables. We did the hat table from Honey mm -hmm. Heist. Um, yep. We did, yeah. It was it was a lot of good stuff. Some shadow gotta, run we, stuff. Yeah, yeah, we got to bring it all back. So uh, yeah. and then add a whole bunch more and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. 
So please come because uh, it won't work if we don't have an audience. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we can start uh, rounding people up when we're there. We'll just be like, could, come yeah. on down. Come on down. Like Price is uh, Right. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, finally, we have a new bonus episode in the One Shot Network Secret Archive. Uh, you can hear Amelia and myself, along with Tracy Burnett. We just talked about this. Uh, create characters for my first released RPG, our final gathering, the dreaded reflections of the immortal soul. I just like saying that title because it's so fun. It is. Um, it's a blend of reflections, uh, dread, and the Highlander series. Uh, so if you're part of the network Patreon at the $5 or higher level, you can check that out right now. Uh, it was a ton of fun showcasing this game, uh, especially with Amelia and Tracy. And you can hear how little I know about Highlander. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and how little you still know about it. I still, I think I know less now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's all we have for announcements today. We know it was a lot, um, but you can check out the show notes and, and find all of that info there. Please meet us back here after the show for our call to action and stay after that for the outtakes from this series. Mm -hmm. Until then, enjoy the show. Welcome back to our discussion episode. Last time, we finished our session zero for Call of Cthulhu. This episode, we will be discussing the character creation process. We are thrilled to welcome back James Kokia. Do you want to reintroduce yourself to everyone and tell us about the character you made last time? For sure, yes. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I am James, and I work for Chaosium. You can find me on Twitter as RoboPelican, and you can catch me streaming Call of Cthulhu on the Chaosium Twitch and YouTube channels. My character is Gregoire Moulinier, the most obnoxious artist in the world. I very much <laughs> picture them as somebody who is stomping around their apartment, flinging paint, hurling abuse at people. They are a talented artist, though. I've given them a huge arts and craft painting score, but I've also given them intimidate and library use and occult <laughs> and all kinds of vicious things that are absolutely critical to the artist's playbook. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, do you want to tell us about your character? Absolutely. So I am playing Agatha Valier, a.k.a. Sybil. Um, Agatha uh, kind of took over the identity of her sibling uh, who was killed uh, in the past, uh, thinking that uh, Sybil, her sibling, was her, Agatha. Uh, not confusing at all. We're twins. That's why. Because uh, Agatha was on hard times financially while Sybil was thriving financially. And to not let the family fortune go to waste, um, Agatha took over Sybil's identity and Sybil's death was penned as Agatha's death. So uh, now I'm leading a double life and I don't know if I'll ever be able to go back to my original life. So not complicated at all. Super no. clear to understand. It's very, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's a trope for a reason. Yep. Sybil uh, and or Agatha. Yep. It's exactly. <laughs> uh, Amelia, how about yourself? Uh, I created Winifred Slaughter, who is a bartender and owner of the Slaughterhouse, <laughs> um, which is a speakeasy. Uh, Winifred is large um, and slightly intimidating but also uh, knows a lot about medicine, first aid, that kind of stuff. All the things that you would need to know in in running a obviously extremely reputable establishment where no one is ever poisoned ever. Don't worry <laughs> about it. It's fine. And there's definitely no backroom gambling happening at all. No, not even a little no. bit. Why would you even ask that, officer? <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's go ahead and dive right into a segment we are calling D20 for Your Thoughts. D20 for Your Thoughts? In this segment, we talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process and um, 
how it relates to this system and other games. But first, we are going to ask the cliche question and get it out of the way. James, how did you first get into RPGs? Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> um, so I, I have, uh, you know, a extended family that are pretty involved in tabletop role-playing games. So I was going to end up in there at some point. But I think that my first experience was when I was living um, in France, uh, in the suburbs of Paris, when I was a little kid. And I was living in the attic of my aunt and uncle's place. And there were this there was this wall of comic books, which I remember very, very fondly. And I had worked my way through them bit by bit by bit over the months that I was there. And finally, I'd read every single comic book available, including some which definitely were not appropriate for kids. But <laughs> I came down and was asking for more books. Um, and I was given a book by um, my, I think my cousin who it was it was it was a D second edition book or the um guide du maître pour donjon et dragon uh in french and i it was the only thing that i had so i went up and i read it and i completely fell in love with it i was absolutely obsessed with um tabletop role-playing games from that day forward um and i was playing all kinds of stuff with my friends all through my childhood uh you know ttrpgs of, of, a, of a different name that i didn't really know them to be ttrpgs yet just sort of like playing games with our imagination and stuff like that mm -hmm. uh when i was uh, a teenager mark morrison of campaign coins and who is a uh, writer for uh chaosium as well uh, along with a variety of other uh, exciting things uh gave me a call of cthulhu handbook for my birthday and that sort of formally moved me into uh the more established tabletop role-playing game scene so yeah very cool you had that like family trajectory that I think a lot of people seem to start with of like, oh, I had a cousin or an uncle or something like that, that kind of hands you stuff and is like, have fun, kid. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that tends to be the way. It was, you know, it was huge. I have a lot of those uh, really fond memories of scanning through a book when I was very, very young and just being amazed by every little bit that you read and going, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. I still have my uh, my French uh, uh, rule book of Dungeons and Dragons, I think second edition out there. Oh, nice. That's really cool. That is really That's cool. That's really cool. <laughs> uh, well, what do you look for in a system as far as character creation? Uh, what pieces need to be there for, for great characters to happen? I tend to be pretty relaxed with what systems I play. I'm fond of most games out there. Um, and I will enjoy most character creation systems. That said, the ones I tend to enjoy more tend to be the ones that provide a little bit more detail. I'm not shy of crunch in systems. I think that uh, Call of Cthulhu and the BRP systems in general are a nice level of crunch, but I don't mind diving in uh, to something that has a, a little more um, uh, mechanics, you know, work that you need to do in deciding exactly what the optimal build is and things like that but i really mm -hmm. like games that give you a lot to work with that give you prompts for your characters that give you exciting things um, and exciting ideas i love backstory stuff and if games don't really have you know a great deal of information that they help you uh, develop about your character uniquely um, then i find it a little bit difficult to get into them yeah absolutely yeah, definitely. I think we've found that too, that a lot of games that have, um, you know, even like small prompts for those backstories or like just like those little little questions that they kind of ask along the way make it a lot more, a lot easier for me to feel attached to what I'm making and more invested in it rather than just like, I don't know, here's some numbers. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, because as we've learned, I don't really like math to begin with, but <laughs> it is it is hard to like come up with an idea of who a person is based on like okay i know their strength their dexterity you know that kind of mm. stuff and i think we saw here for us that like when we got into some of those backstory like rolling on those tables we started to see who our characters were um mm -hmm. for ryan it's like the whole thing now <laughs> <laughs> um it really came together there and i i like i like that kind of stuff in games yeah absolutely how do we think that character creation in Call of Cthulhu stacks up against other systems that we've played? 
Well, I think that the frailty of the characters is a central point of Call of Cthulhu. And I think the character creation experience sort of underlines that. The One of the typical trajectories for people getting into Call of Cthulhu is that they come across from a game like Dungeons and Dragons. And I remember mm-hmm. personally coming across from Dungeons and Dragons, rolling up my character in Call of Cthulhu and suddenly realizing, oh my God, you know, just the process of rolling these dice and having a lot of control taken away from me from my character and seeing how little health I had and um, seeing that I really wasn't this grand hero and didn't have a lot of tricks up my sleeve to keep me alive really mm-hmm. changed my perspective on what the game was going to be. It showed me that I was going to have to play in a different way. I think that the themes that Call of Cthulhu has around uh, the, you know, insignificance of the individual compared to the grander horrors that are going on and the sort of slow burn, the more focus on backstory, uh, the more focus on uh, character development come through in the character creation process. Like you Mm -hmm. said, those backgrounds really do a lot of the heavy lifting. Yeah, it was really interesting seeing how low some of those percentages start. And Mm -hmm. it it really kind of gave you the sense that you're not going to be amazing at a lot of things. And and it really kind of hit home uh, that, you know, if you don't put points into this thing, you're, you're going to be at 5% for success. And that's, that's wildly low uh, for, mm-hmm. for really good success. <laughs> yeah. Especially when you realize that you're rolling a D100 uh, to get there, right? Um, yeah. tr- you translate that to a D20 system and that's like, okay, you, you only succeed if you're rolling at 20. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and goodness, that's not too many people, uh, would, would, a- agree that that sounds powerful. Right. I think it's, you know, I, I said before when we were making characters too, that it's, it, it is very different from the, like, I come in and I'm the hero of the story, you mm-hmm. know, like it's larger than life character and i think it is it is one that you probably have to come in with we talk all the time about like the importance of a session zero and understanding what kind of game you're getting into Mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff um but one that you need to come into understanding that like failure is going to (laughs) happen um and that's okay Mm -hmm. because they've definitely played with people who are not okay with failing roles um and (laughs) friends this is not the game for you (laughs) (laughs) The Call of Cthulhu is definitely a game where you want to be pushing yourself and really embracing failure. There's also a fantastic mechanic in Call of Cthulhu called the push mechanic, which is mm-hmm. when you fail a role, you can choose to push the role. And that means that you get a free re-roll, but you take an enhanced penalty. So for example, say that you're trying to climb up something, scale up, you know, a scale up to a second floor window so you can break in. If you fail the role, you might say, oh, you can't find the handhold you're not going to be able to make it. But if you decide to push the roll, you get to re-roll, you may, may, may succeed, but if you fail, you're going to fall and you might break a leg on the way down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I love systems that have those kinds of things, though, because I think in, you know, in fiction, it's you have a character say, no, this is something that's really important to me and I do need to try harder, that you wouldn't just go, hmm, okay, I can't, I guess I'll move on. Mm-hmm. Um, that there are those times where you say, you know, like I, I know it's risky, but I, I need to be able to do this because my character really would put everything into it. And so I, I really appreciate games that have those systems to like take that added risk mm-hmm. and say, no, this is something like I, I need to do this. Yeah. Um, I also really love rolling for things. And I, I was very happy that I was able to roll for all my stats. We don't we, we haven't covered too many games that are like here, roll your stats. Yeah, uh, which has been very surprising over these years um, you know, to because because I came from games that were like you only roll your stats. Mm-hmm. And and uh, so the more games that we got into that were like, OK, here, pick these stats or here's your base stats, adjust them a little bit or whatever. Or we don't even have stats in this game. Yeah, we haven't um, played a lot of like, quote unquote, like modern games that have random stat generation, have we? Yeah, not too many. Uh, so I, I was very uh, thrilled to see that we actually rolled for our, our attributes here. Um, uh, our I have a hard time with it. Like, I know 
I have a hard time with it <laughs> I know. because I'm like, I don't want to be, you know, like, because I can't put all my points into intelligence because <laughs> I right. can't just <laughs> like that's, you know, that decision is made for me. And I have a really difficult time as a player. Um, I, I know, I know what I want. <laughs> I don't give up that little bit of agency, right? <laughs> right, right. I mean, it definitely leads to a very different character than I would have, I would have picked for myself, which is good. Mm -hmm. It's fun to like play outside the box sometimes. And, you know, like I definitely do enjoy the act of of rolling um i don't know how i feel about it for like a long campaign and something that i know that i need to oh, be yeah. attached to <laughs> you know but um yeah it's definitely a very different vibe when you roll for those stats than it is when you don't so mm -hmm. there are as i mentioned uh, in the previous uh, episode there are um uh options for using an array system to uh, generate your mm -hmm. skills and things like oh, that. Oh, lovely. So yeah, I was you... sure that if, if there wasn't one in the book, somebody had written one somewhere because <laughs> <laughs> there, there are people like me out there. <laughs> Absolutely. And there is, it, there's all, it's also worth mentioning that in general, in Call of Cthulhu, since your characters are just so frail anyway, uh, mm -hmm. a couple of points here and there doesn't make a huge difference. So a lot of the keepers that I've played with and when I'm keeping myself, I, I tend to not mind people, you know, changing a stat or two or a detail of someone says hey i really want to play a character that looks like this but i rolled this you know it's pretty easy to mm -hmm. change something sure. it's not going to break the integrity of the game in the same way that making a change in dungeons and dragons might because obviously it's such a mechanically uh important game right yeah, absolutely so so how does the character uh creation process uh reinforce the feel of call of cthulhu and set expectations for play well i think that um hmm because my thought is like it, it sets you up for dealing with percentages, right? And thinking percentages and thinking halves and, and fifths of percentages and all that sort of stuff. And and like the, the whole act of rolling your attributes, right? Uh, 3d6 or 2d6 plus 6 and then multiply that times 5. You're, you're converting all of this stuff into percentages, which is really fascinating to me. And then you know th throughout play when you roll stuff you're going to be rolling percentages for the most part right absolutely so i also think though from like rolling the stats the thing that it tells me is that this game has the potential to be very swingy yeah. that like it's you know like you have the potential to like succeed greatly um but also to to fail miserably <laughs> mm -hmm. um that like there is a wide range of way things can go it's not you know i mean it is still that bell curve of like the majority of things are going to happen within that first standard deviation um but that there is you know there is a lot that can happen out on those edges too that you're not gonna like consistently there are those games where it's like okay i'm gonna succeed pretty much every time and a failure is going to be really like out of the question mm -hmm. and this is like no if you stick to the things that you know how to do you're pretty okay um you could do really well depending on how you mm -hmm. allotted your points but like you also could do really badly absolutely yeah i think that those are both very interesting points i think that uh, addressing what you were talking about, about the swinginess of the system. I think that, um, yeah, it, it's interesting. Obviously, in some sense, it is a really, really clear, super uh, simple percentage system. If you have 70 in something, you are going to succeed 70% of the time. And you can really mm -hmm. clearly see what is behind all of the maths. Um, in fact, I, I know some mm -hmm. people who really like that aspect of it, that there's no mm -hmm. doubt. And I know that some people who like a little bit of mystery and they like to be rolling kind of dice pools and not sort of be sure where things are going to go rather than looking at a stat and knowing exactly what the... Uh, the potential for something is yeah um but uh yeah th there are obviously degrees of success and failure um what i think is maybe pulls it back from being super swingy is that a failure by 50 points and a failure by three points are functionally the same mm -hmm. um uh, unless you fumble, uh, you're really not going to be facing, you know, scaling penalties. And if you fall behind by a lot in certain systems, you can really, really suffer for it. Sure, sure. In, Which I do yeah. appreciate. Like, mm -hmm. that's, um, I mean, I do, I do like when there's, I like that there's fumbles. I like that, like, there are times you can be like, oh, I just really, really messed that up. Because <laughs> um, I think it, um, especially in a system 
that, you know, that you are going to fail a decent amount of the time. It keeps it interesting rather than like, it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. It doesn't, mm-hmm. you know, it kind of um, keeps things moving a little bit and keeps it interesting. And I'm also mm-hmm. one of those people that like, I, I, a lot of the time enjoy failing. I find failing to be more interesting um, just because I, again, like I said, like bad things to happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's fun for me. Um, but I, I like when there are sort of, you know, there's a little bit of a delineation between like, it doesn't work and like, oh, it, it goes wrong. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I totally understand that having that. And if you enjoy failure, you kind of that sliding scale becomes even more important. Um, Absolutely. Uh, to answer what you were saying uh, just before, though, about how it gets you thinking in terms of percentiles, I think that's very true. And I have usually found uh, the BRP system and Call of Cthulhu in particular is just so easy to teach to people. It's a great convention game because you can really sort of get people across the basics of it in about five minutes. And if there is a question that somebody has, it's really, really easy to answer. The character mm-hmm. creation process here, uh, although the mathematics are a little bit tough in terms of um, getting those characters through uh, when you initially immediately look at them, you hear that you've got, you know, 270 points that you need to assign and you go, oh my God, that's a lot of points. But in reality, (laughs) uh, it's pretty simple. And once you go through the process of character creation, you're basically ready to play. You get it. You've seen what the system does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have to say that, like, allocating those points isn't hard. For me, it's it's more a matter of, like, I have that choice paralysis generally. So it's like, you have choices and now you have to make them. And I'm like, oh, I don't. I hate choices more than I hate math. Um, so, you know, it's like allocating 200 points and being like 10 here, 10 here, 12 here, you know, that's not so bad. So like, I think if you gave me 15, 20 minutes at a convention, I would, I would handle it. I would love for somebody to highlight my sheet for me and be like, these are the ones you should pick. And then I can Mm -hmm. decide where, how much goes into what. Um, but yeah, I could see this being a, a super easy one to show up and just like have somebody hand me a sheet and say, spread these points out yeah and then mm-hmm. that that's you know uh that really works uh in in in, in 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 convention play often it's one you you have pre-written characters for one shots sure. that are glued into the story in some way um and for uh longer campaigns at least the ones that are uh pre-written by chaosium generally they start with something that says look when you're creating characters these are the ones that are going to be most useful so as a keeper you should be saying to your players you exactly what you've just suggested highlight you know survival and pilot boat and uh, mm. things like that and be like you might need these you know uh pay attention <laughs> right yeah which is why you know again what a session zero is for is to say you know like here's the kind of game that we're playing so i don't show up with you know all of my points in ride and everybody's like mm, we're gonna be on a train though actually so yeah, yeah. <laughs> not a but, lot of horses but we're riding the train <laughs> oh great i am the best passenger <laughs> My manners are impeccable. Mm-hmm. I roll ride. <laughs> I, I I do like how uh, with the and I, I kind of talked about this before with the percentage is so low. Uh, it is kind of leaning into that failure part, but that's especially important for a horror game, right? Yes. Because yeah, hair, we didn't uh, even talk about that. Because failure, like, is is it drives the horror right mm-hmm. if you're constantly and it has consequences su- of its own besides exactly. just like you don't do it you know like yeah. you think about like locksmith or something like that yeah and it's like i go to pick a lock and you can't do it it's not just like well i guess we don't open that door it's like oh crap now we can't escape <laughs> yeah oh there's this thing chasing us and i failed the lock pick and now we're stuck here with no way out how do we get out of this yeah as this monstrosity is stalking us from the darkness mm-hmm you're mm-hmm. absolutely right. And uh, that makes failures feel much, much more severe when one mistaken role can be the difference between life or death. Yeah. Talking about the character sheets specifically, uh, one of the other things that the character creation process uh, sort of touches on is the way that the story is going to focus on the you know, building of horror slowly and on investigation and on downtime, just looking at it, you can see that there are skills like accounting, there are skills Mm -hmm. like anthropology, uh, there are skills like appraise, you know, uh, these skills that don't necessarily fit into the immediate action-packed tropes that you might expect jumping into a game. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true too. There's a there are not very many skills that are related to combat at all. It's like what dodge, um, firearms, fighting. 
Yeah. And it's like most of the other ones are sort of, you know, quote unquote downtime <laughs> activities, mm-hmm. you know, um, there's it's it's pretty limited as far as like, you know, just beating stuff up. Yeah. But which tells you that the game's going to be a lot of mundane stuff, uh, mostly throughout. And you're just mundane characters trying to survive a situation, right? Right. Or that those, you know, that those sort of I I really hate the word mundane, but like that those, you know, sort of like low key activities are going to be what a lot of the actual um, story and narrative is centered around. Mm-hmm. That it's not going to be about those big battles like it is in D&D where it's, you know, it's like we go out and we fight the thing and like fighting that thing is the central point of a session. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is going to be a lot about like preparing for that and you know like all of the things around dealing with the the big bad absolutely it's it's the slow creeping horror it's the mystery it's the opportunity to really make your characters sing and it's the opportunity to also explore really unique and interesting historical environments Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and it does it does a good job of of highlighting that i think um Mm -hmm. and again i think highlighting you know, because those those base starting percentages are right on the sheet there too. It does a good job of highlighting the fact that, like, uh, you know, you're not great at stuff. <laughs> you're not going to be <laughs> overwhelmingly amazing. Um, I'm trying to like look through and see like what is the thing that you start out best at, and it's like, I guess, fighting or firearms maybe. Um, but most everything else, spot hidden. Spot um, hidden, twenty five percent. Yeah, a lot of yeah. stuff is like the one five ten range. Mm-hmm. Which is so low. Right? When you're yeah, out of a hundred, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so so you basically got a snowflakes chance in hell of getting through it and you you try your best and uh uh sometimes it works. And then of course you get to advance that skill if you succeeded in a role, but I guess we'll talk about that mm-hmm. when we break into advancement in more detail. Yeah. So you're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> a very tiny one. Mm-hmm. Well, we kind of we kind of answered the next question about the the story that the character sheets tell, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think we can go right to the next one of uh, what do you think is the the biggest flaw of character creation in this system, and and what's one of your favorite parts? Um, so I think that uh, in terms of flaws, I think that that sort of comes with. Uh, the perspective that you come in from uh, with with that that kind of like uh, attitude of of being wanting wanting to be a hero and wanting to uh, you know power game and create something that is uh, very very you know uh, strong and mechanically optimized and I think mm-hmm. that some people come into uh, Call of Cthulhu and they will look at the stats and they will say why is it counting here why would I pick a counting when I can pick you know one of the gun stats or spot hidden and if you want a power game Call of Cthulhu it's not super difficult you start looking up and down you start thinking okay I'll take some spot hidden I'll take some dodge uh, I'll take some of this I'll take some of that you know I'll bump up my credit rating to massive so I don't have to worry about any of that sort of detail um and that is really a a flaw that it is exploitable but it's also kind of part of the it 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 shows how the game is focusing on something different so uh, you know you can be this you know very very specific um type of character that is perhaps going to you know ensure their own survival um, and ensure that they're able to kind of shoot very, very well at most monsters. And unless you hit one of the admittedly many monsters that are just immune to bullets and that humans (laughs) cannot kill, um, uh, you're going to be able to fight your way out of most situations. Mm -hmm. Um, But that type of character doesn't tend to be the funnest type of character to play in Call Mm -hmm. of Cthulhu. And... uh, in fact, they can be kind of, uh, you know, difficult at a table, especially if the rest of the table are all very into the idea of the game and are running around, you know, going into the library. And you've got this lone ranger gunslinger who is going, well, mm-hmm. I don't really have anything to do here. Um, and if they're not <laughs> into the role play aspect, can feel kind of isolated. I, so, I think that yeah. type of character really uh, would lend well to the bumbling uh, action hero trope. Right, uh, somebody that's just that there for the guns. That would be a great guns. way to like role play it. Of like, okay, I'm here, and we're gonna take down the monster, and everything. Like, okay, here's a book I need you to research, and being like, I don't speak Latin or Greek. 
but I can shoot it in the face. <laughs> and, like, that's, and everybody else around the table being like, um, actually, you can't because it's immune to bullets. And, like, uh, yeah, absolutely. And that can be such a fun trope. I definitely love playing the uh, character who's going to run head on in. Um, <laughs> yep. uh, but yeah, it, 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 it can be tough if you come in with a, you know, um, an idea that uh, – this you you can look at the system and go this isn't balanced you know and mm-hmm. and it's not and uh that is a flaw for some players um and uh you know the the does is is call of cthulhu suitable for every player type you know uh, maybe it should be um but uh, uh I, no. I i think that yeah well yeah there you go so 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 no. it's, a, it's 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 a flaw in some senses um uh, but the best part of the uh character creation process Look, for me, I think that it is just the way that it sparks so many ideas. You look at this Mm. and you immediately have all these crazy concepts that are just throwing themselves at you. You start rolling ideologies, you start looking at your your stats, and almost immediately something exciting will show itself to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll agree with that. Uh, I had no idea going into this what I was going to have, even Mm -hmm. remotely, and then... Once everything's just started lining up, I'm like, all right, th- this makes Here sense now. This yep. makes sense. Yeah, I I feel like it it fell into place really easily. Um, and I, I think a lot of people we record with kind of have the same sort of um, like a flaw in their in their games, saying that like, you know, if you come in expecting this kind of thing, this game isn't going to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I totally respect that but like that's why there are so many different games <laughs> um because like it might not be the game for you and that's okay mm-hmm. um i think that's that's more a flaw in the player than the game uh, <laughs> but i think i think you're right that it has you know it, it if you want to come in and be the hero and you know save the world uh, it might not be what you want mm-hmm. um but i think i think it signposts that so many at so many places along the way that if you get past character creation and you sit down and you're like, I'm going to play this game and you're like still ready to be the hero, then like that's on you. Yeah. <laughs> like you, you missed so many flags along yeah. the way. And, you know, then grab Pulp Cthulhu and you can shoot stuff in the face. So, you know, there you no, go. There, you go. That's, that's, yeah. there's, there are options available. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> this is our favorite part of the show. Um, where we we do our fan fiction, um, we like to talk about our character stories. How this group ended up as a group? Like, what are we doing? How does this game go? Yeah. How how did this um, apparently very annoying artist, <laughs> this um, you know identity theft twin <laughs> <laughs> and a bartender end up together? Well, the classic introduction for a Call of Cthulhu story, the sort of you all meet in a tavern equivalent, is that you're all called to the reading of the will of some distant colleague or family member or person from your life, and they leave you a note saying, oh, dear God, I, I was part of some terrible cult and we, we left something in the <laughs> attic of a farmhouse or some other, um, uh, you know, uh, terrible uh, set of instructions that are left mm. for you. And then after being bound in one suit, supernatural event you tend to see between the lines of society and you hear about the others and then as a collection mm. tend to go through more and more like that that's the standard setup all right i want i want something more eccentric yeah, i want it to yeah. be the reading of your dead sister's will oh <laughs> <laughs> well that's interesting because the reading of my dead sister's will would be the reading of my will yeah because because we faked that right, right. Um, but but my, but myself doesn't I, I don't have anything really to my name at that point, right? Mm. Um, which could be interesting as well. Or or maybe maybe I did have a little bit and I have to give it away. But my my sister had more, and uh, it and maybe hers was more prestigious. Mm. Well, it would be weird for her to die and like not leave a will if she had so much. Exactly. Maybe. Um... You, you, I mean, you could have, yeah, you could have le- left some kind of, even, even if it's just like in memory of or left some letters or whatever. Um, yeah. Something a little more eccentric. Perhaps your character, uh, uh, you know, Ag- Ag- Agatha witnessed um, 
the, 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 the Agatha believes that the murder of Sybil was somehow supernatural in nature. You have some mm. kind of piece of information that you believe, uh, you know, marks uh, the 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 person who did it as you know being part of a cult or uh, being in access to dark powers. So, as part of this fake will reading, um, you call on um, yours, you know, some 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 companions or some friends that you have to. Um, uh, uh, you know, come and help you investigate or something like that. And you are trying to, you know, prove your disguise to them. Otherwise, the other classic is that we all happen to be in one location when a disaster happens. Oh, yeah. You know, where we're all at a, we're, there's a great scenario called Dead Man Stomp. We are all at an underground jazz bar um, <laughs> listening to uh, a performance and suddenly a bunch of gangsters come in and shoot up someone on the stage while everyone's oh, taking wow. shelter. Um and the gangsters are running away. The body on the stage lurches back to its feet and begins to crawl through the uh, the uh, uh, hall. You know, clearly undead. And the adventure goes from there. Oh, wild! Mm-hmm. I, I was thinking, what if, um, what if, like, in, instead of like meeting by happenstance, what if it was like um, I hired uh, the the local artist uh re- lo- local renowned artist to do some art uh, on your crocodiles mm-hmm. maybe on the crocodiles or <laughs> or more more realistically like just like maybe a, a memorial mural yep. mm-hmm. or something in the mansion in, mm-hmm. in the estate and maybe as part of that we needed to do some renovations to highlight it better and maybe uh james your character uncovered something uh, hidden within the walls, which kind of hints towards that supernatural, like death more yeah. of, uh, of my sibling and that it wasn't more of a, it wasn't exactly a mistaken identity thing. Like I thought it was. I love that. Right? That sounds fantastic. So I'm coming to you with this evidence. Uh, and yeah, that, that sounds brilliant. Yeah. And, and I, lo- I also love like, um, my, my bartender friend from my Agatha days, um, mm-hmm. that I always confided in probably the one person that knows my secret. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe after my sibling's death, I still kind of, uh, you know, uh, pulled you in. I'm the only person that, uh, you're the only person I really fully confided in. Well, my one connection was to a fellow player. Um, yeah. It, it said it was to prove myself, but obviously, like, we can change that around, too, because that was a, another random role, so we can adjust things as necessary. Yeah. Um. But, yeah, it's, I mean, potentially the only person that knew, like, knows that you are not who, you, like, I know you well enough to know yeah. <laughs> that you're not who you say you are. Exactly. Like, yeah. there's some maybe some mannerisms of Agatha that uh, you're seeing in Sybil. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're wondering why you're called, uh, to the estate for, uh, some, some unconnected things, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that would be a really fun, uh, story to tell and kind of see like the, the underside of this, uh, uh, estate possibly that, that might well, have had its hand in some tunnels below the Having ground. just watched Muppets Haunted Mansion last night, <laughs> oh. I am all for Spooky House. Oh, I've, yeah. <laughs> I have not seen Muppets Haunted Mansion. It's, uh, you know, some of the darker horror movies, you know, turn me off a little bit. So I, Right. I well, it's, it can be really scary. Like, it can be really tough. My kids watched it before bed and it might have been too much. <laughs> <laughs> It's a pretty creepy one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm, no, I love like a good like, you know, room behind a room in yeah. a mansion kind of a thing. Yeah. Like that's a great vibe. That's oh, a great I, vibe. Haunted mansion uh, sounds amazing. Yes, mm-hmm. I love it. I love it. I hope that there's like a summoning circle in the basement. Oh, there has to be, right? Duh. <laughs> <laughs> Little do you know, your uh, your you know, Sybil was very very involved in the occult. Uh, yeah, exactly. Why does her closet have so many cloaks in it? I know. <laughs> These are not a fashion. These aren't cloaks. <laughs> oh, so robes, ago. I'll have you know. <laughs> sorry. The, the hood is the, is the difference. I'm sorry. Yep. Oh, that sounds amazing. I love it. Ah, I want to play this. I know. I but... do too. Really badly. <laughs> It'd be a lot of fun. Do the collection of you have, a, have an idea of where the arc would ultimately lead your characters? What the, what your, uh, 
your 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 character's personal story arc would be? I don't. I don't really know like what my like long term goal is. Ryan, yeah. I see Ryan having to like come to terms with like yeah what your real identity is. Like who, like who are you really? Are you mm-hmm. Sybil or are you Agatha? And like, exactly having to um, make that decision. The tone, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, as well as like figuring out what all this this weird occult stuff is and can i untangle uh my family fortune uh from the the undersided side of things i was just or- trying to be a small business owner and <laughs> and now like it turns out that all of this other stuff is happening and like can i can i ever go back to normal can i ever just go back to the slaughterhouse <laughs> 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 As opposed to the literal slaughterhouse, yeah, <laughs> right, uh-huh. fantastic. I, I like it. I, I, I like a, a visual of like the slaughterhouse having the the neon sign, but the S is like kind of flashes in and out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah that's brilliant. Very perfect. Clever. Perfect neon signs, big in the twenties. <laughs> I don't know. I think, I think they 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 were actually. Um, they came really? with yeah yeah no. I I was um I didn't actually I haven't actually put this in a scenario yet. But I've all the neon was just becoming a thing. Yeah, I think it had been discovered a, a while back, but it was just starting to get popularized. And there were these traveling salesmen who would walk around with suitcases filled with like neon rods to show off oh, all of like neon stuff. So I had this idea that I was going to put into a scenario that I wrote a while ago set in this rural town where um, uh, it's, you know, right out in the middle of the country, you know, no, like, uh, you know, no phone lines and it's very, very isolated, but there's neon signs everywhere because this town, like, really thought it was cool. So they bought out oh. the entire <laughs> stock of this one thing. So you walk into the middle of, like, amongst these farms and stuff and there's, like, weird neon signs on every uh Oh, uh, I love that. <laughs> yeah. What a cool, cool aesthetic. Mm. It is so creepy. Oh, I love that. Oh. I, I the the neon glow uh in a horror setting is uh it just adds so much atmosphere especially if it gets foggy yes it's yeah a, if it gets foggy and if it like blinks in and out it's yeah. a nice little bit of spice isn't it yeah oh yeah. And, and 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 i can hear it right you can yeah. hear that buzz uh, yeah. just thinking about it right yes oh yeah. goodness yep it's bloody great yeah well let's go ahead and get into our advancement discussion and take it up a level take it up a level Take it up a level. So in this segment, we like to discuss character advancement and growth. So how does a character level up, quote unquote, in Call of Cthulhu? And how do they change mechanically sure. when that happens? Yeah, yeah. So there's no levels in Call of Cthulhu. Um, mm-hmm. But when your character completes um, a scenario, um, and some people might put this at the end of each individual session of play or some people might put this at the uh, end of a you know a milestone achievement if you're writing pre-written scenarios you can put it at the end of a section of a of a story you are mm. given the opportunity to make a collection of improvement roles so if on your character sheet, you can see that you have all these spaces for ticks to be made. When you are playing, uh, whenever you succeed a skill roll, you tick it. Um, at the end of play, uh, when you get to one of those advancement points, you make an advancement check for each of the tick skills. And an advancement check is like what we made uh-huh. previously with the education advancement check. So you roll the dice and you actually want to fail this check. And if you fail, you increase the value by a d10. So that means it gets harder and harder to get better, the better you are. Oh, very wow. interesting. So it, it sounds like if you space out your use of skills throughout a session uh that's just more chances of uh increasing in uh those skills right? absolutely and you will occasionally uh find situations where you're really struggling to see how you can fit natural world into this situation or something like that <laughs> but yeah in general you roll stuff and as you succeed it you'll have the chance to uh scale it up now um uh, there's not a massive amount of change for characters in Call of Cthulhu compared to some systems. You know, you get a character in uh, Dungeons and Dragons.
Legends, who's been played for 20 sessions, and a character in Call of Cthulhu that's been played for 20 sessions, and the you know disparity between the two is going to be pretty different. But mm-hmm. um, some scenarios will allow you to take on uh, extra things. You can, in your downtime, for example, take courses at the Miskatonic University, study there, um, and you know may build up some other skills like that. You can also gain access to spells and things like that. Now, spells in Call of mm. Cthulhu are absolutely deadly and best not to be trifled with, but they can give you a very powerful edge. <laughs> I mean, that that sounds fun. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, the skills that you don't start with, too. Those are also up for utilizing and advancing, right? Uh, yes, absolutely. Any skill you can advance any skill as long as you succeed a check with it. And, um, you know, some things inside, uh, uh, certain scenarios will allow you to check a skill, even if you don't succeed in it. For example, if you're playing a game, uh, set at a university, you might read a book about something and then, okay, we'll check your, um, you know, science biology skill and you can advance it. Oh, very cool. I like that. So, uh, it, it does sound like, uh, the narrative has an effect on advancement, but does, the advancement have more of an effect on the narrative uh, aside from you're just better so at things? I think the bigger thing about advancement in Call of Cthulhu is the gradual disintegration of your character. And that is the real advancement as your character becomes more mm. and more aware of the Cthulhu mythos. And that is mechanized using the Cthulhu mythos skill. You'll have a skill which starts at zero when you create a new character called Cthulhu mythos. And as you become exposed to the mythos, it slowly, slowly grows. Oh, And this uh, is paralleled by your sanity slowly, slowly decaying. Even if you manage to succeed all your roles and you're doing great and you're managing to even maybe get a scrape a net positive insanity gain because you didn't see the monster and you got the ritual before you had to fight it. Um, Unfortunately, as your Cthulhu mythos rises, you will lose sanity because your maximum sanity is always uh, 100 minus your Cthulhu mythos skill. Oh, no. So as your Cthulhu mythos grows, you become inherently less sane. And if you were to ever reach 100 Cthulhu mythos, then there is no room for sanity for someone who truly understands what is beyond. Oh, that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, it's so it's so weird because, like, until you mentioned uh, the sanity mechanics again, I completely forgot about them. <laughs> like, I, I know what game we're playing. I know what game we're creating characters for. But like uh, everything else, it's like, oh, yeah, failure. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, uh, you're probably going to fail a lot, but you're also going to lose your mind. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Sanity mechanics. Uh, And, you know, it it really, you know, as you lose sanity, it becomes easier to lose sanity because you are lowering your sanity score. So when you make sanity checks, it becomes easier and easier to fail. Uh, Your values for your temporary bouts of insanity get lower and lower and lower. Um, And it's a definite bouts of insanity get lower and lower and lower. Uh, And it just becomes more and more complicated. You are more and more likely uh, to run into issues very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's very cool. Yeah. So advancement, more of like, I guess, advance, advancement towards death, you know, uh, regression, if you will. Mm -hmm. No, it definitely uh, advances the stakes. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Well, James, is there is there anything else that we want to say? about Call of Cthulhu uh, before we head out. Well, look, I, 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 you know, I know that uh, fans of this podcast will have a really wide exposure to um, a bunch of tabletop role-playing games because you've done such a good job explaining so many of them. Um, so I don't need to do the standard, you know, oh, try some things that, you know, aren't, aren't maybe the mainstream tabletop role-playing games. You're going to have a great time. <laughs> you know, obviously Call of Cthulhu is still relatively mainstream contained compared to a lot of uh, indie TTRPGs, but... Um, uh, you know, I, my, my pitch to the standard TTRPG gamer is still to try and get them to try some other stuff. Um, but uh, to your audience, I, I, I guess I would say that um, Call of Cthulhu, uh, you know, for me and I think for hopefully uh, some of you, um, has a really special place and will have a really special place because it allows you to tell these really, really deep thrilling slow burn stories that are focused on investigation and that are focused on mystery if you Mm -hmm. look at films like john carpenter's the thing and you think that is just fantastic and if you look at these you know thrilling stories uh where 
the humanity is kind of made small um, and uh, the uh, actions of the individual are superseded uh, by the enormity of the cosmos, you know, stories like Arrival, stories like Annihilation, uh, Mm -hmm. innumerable uh, works of fiction that I could mention, then this really gives you a vessel to tell those stories in an extraordinary way. It is a historical joy, and I really, really encourage you to check it out. Absolutely. Well, James, thank you so much for joining us to talk about Call of Cthulhu. Hey, thanks for having me. It was great to be here. Absolutely. Uh, Can you remind everyone where they can find you online and what sort of things you're working on? Absolutely. I am on uh, Twitter as RoboPelican. You can catch me uh, streaming uh, on the Chaosium YouTube channel and on the Chaosium Twitch channel. Um, And if you follow me on Twitter, I'm sure you will uh, hear about all the other projects I'm working on. So Mm -hmm. there you go. Well, thank you again for joining us. And thank you to everyone for listening. Call to action. Yeah, like that. Well, Ryan, that's it. We finally covered Call of Cthulhu. Finally. (laughs) Finally, we did it. It's only been, what, almost three and a half years? Yep, yep. Um, (laughs) But it was, I mean, it was a lot of fun. And I, I think I said it before, but like, I can't believe that I haven't gotten to play this game because it's like exactly what i want in a game yeah so. absolutely um and and i've heard it on some ap's here and there but uh it, it was uh, really interesting learning about the system uh firsthand uh and seeing how how everything's made yeah and i really like um you know, we got to talk a little bit about like Pulp Cthulhu and some of the other like kind of variations of it too. So mm. that there's a little something for everybody here. If that like, um, you know, sort of like failure mm. <laughs> that's very likely in the system isn't your thing, then, you know, there are some other options for you to kind of yeah. make it your game, but still yeah. do the sort of investigative cosmic horror kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, I thought that was really cool. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Mm hmm. Um, so, you know, we, we are going from this series to kind of an extended break. Mm -hmm. Um, let's, let's do some call to action before we let everybody go. Absolutely. Uh, first up, we've got a couple of Kickstarters, uh, to remind you about, uh, check out the Haunted Hill Academy Kickstarter uh, in the show notes. Uh, it's a pretty great game and it does need some help getting funded as of the time of this recording. Uh, so it'd be awesome if you stop on by, uh, it's only $5 to get the rules, uh, $15 to get, uh, a well-presented PDF. Mm-hmm. And honestly, that's a steal for, for a game that, that sounds like you could have a lot of fun with. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of options possible in that game. So Mm -hmm. very good deal. Absolutely. Um, Also check out the Questlandia Kickstarter, uh, which has already funded. uh, But there are options to get some of the other great games uh, that come from this team as well. In addition to that, uh, next week is a Catacon. We will both be there and um, planning some games. We also have our panel on Saturday where we create random characters with people attending the panel. It was Mm -hmm. so much fun last time. Like, I mean, honestly, like one of the most fun con panel experiences I've had. Mm -hmm. Um, It it was great. So if you are available during that time, if you're attending, please go ahead and sign up. We would Mm -hmm. love to see you there. Absolutely. Um, also, you can check out the One Shot Network Secret I- Secret Archive for our bonus content released uh, just this last week, uh, where we cover uh, my game, uh, Our Final Gathering, The Dreaded Reflections of the Immortal Soul. Um, and it's really fun. I'm going to be playing that at a catacomb as well. So if you're signed up for the game, one of the four people that have already signed up, and you are members of the Secret Archive, you can get a little taste of how the game works before you go. Uh, then I don't have to explain it as much. I'll, st- I'll still explain it. Don't <laughs> yeah, worry. Okay. It's fine. Uh, that leaves us with one last order of business. Review time. Woo-hoo. We need a song for that, too. <laughs> that is right. We have a review to read. If you want your five star review read on here, you can make us feel amazing and uh, we can shower you with thanks. Please leave it wherever you can leave reviews on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser or Stitcher or, uh, you know, wherever, wherever else you leave reviews. I'm sure I'm leaving out something. Uh Um, We are about to read one from Tentacosaurus 
on Podchaser. Is that like tentacles and a dinosaur uh, together? It's very possible. That sounds really awesome. Uh, if it is Tentacosaurus, please let us know because that's amazing. Uh huh. This podcast gave me a lot of great insight into so many marvelous games. The hosts bring their experience, enthusiasm, and a lot of fun to the table. Their guests often bring their own unique viewpoints. This podcast is a delightful showcase for a fun hobby. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. I yeah. love that the number of times we get called delightful, too. It's I, just I, like a fun. I love it. <laughs> it's yeah. great. We are delightful. And we are delightful. <laughs> and, very, and very modest. Absolutely. So humble. <laughs> so humble. <laughs> uh, well, thank you again, uh, Tentacosaurus. And uh, that's all we have for this month. Uh, it's actually the end of the month, which is unusual for our series to conclude. Um, but the next month, we're going to be taking a hiatus. Uh, we're both going to a catacon. So that's taking up our time, uh, but we might have some sort of content in November possibly to release. I don't know if there's going to be a spotlight. I don't know if there's just going to be a fun little thing that we do. We are going to um, see what we are up for. Uh, may maybe. How quickly Ryan is able to unpack. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we can do a recording in person at a catacan. Oh. Um to uh, just cover a micro game or something. Yeah, and that would be throw fun. that in the feed. That would be a lot of fun. Uh, so we'll see what we do. I, I'm bringing my cool setup, and I've got two awesome mics that we're going to be throwing out there. So uh, yeah. maybe it'll maybe it'll just be nice, uh, nice to do that for once. Yeah. So hopefully, the, the goal is that we have something in November, but we will not have a regular series um, just because of mm -hmm. us being gone at a catacon and uh, yeah. Ryan's move, and then also Thanksgiving and my birthday are in there somewhere. So it's mm -hmm. just like a lot. It's just a lot. Absolutely. Happening. So uh, we'll we'll see if we can set up a recording uh, for business as usual in December. Uh, but December might be delayed a little bit as well, knowing that all of that holiday stuff is in there too. Yeah, and it has to get recorded in November to release in December. So absolutely. Uh, so until we're back, uh, please stay safe, everyone. Uh, drink some water. Take care of yourselves. Get vaccinated, uh, and keep making those amazing people. We'll see you next time. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. Now we gotta read some show blurbs. 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 Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com, where you'll find other great shows like Neoscum.
Neoscum is a narrative comedy podcast featuring five Chicago improvisers antagonizing their way through the role-playing classic Shadowrun. It follows a group of misfits and outsiders. Z, the acerbic cyber troublemaker. Pox, the candy junkie klepto from across the pond. Tech Wizard, the public access actor with a petulant thirst for adventure. And Dak Rambo, the nastiest trucker this side of the Robo Mason Dixon. Join the irascible Neo Scum crew on a puerile rockin' road trip through a weirdo world of tomorrow, doling out street justice to every deeb they encounter, whether they deserve it or not. E- All right. Great. All right, waveforms. I clicked it. One. Yep, Bizarre. looks like my <laughs> audacity is recording just fine. Might move Perfect. My microphone a little bit closer just to... Ooh. I don't, it doesn't matter if we can see it. <laughs> I suppose, I suppose not. All right. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, great. So, so ready to go in you are, I suppose. Perfect. Um, so if we're all set, I'll give us a five count of silence to pick up background noise so we can get rid of that in post editing. Can you and wait? Then... I'm sorry. It's I, like, I know I'm supposed to be the professional one here. I, don't have any glasses over here and i oh. would like to see so two yeah seconds. glasses are i knew something was different i was like yeah. wait show, yeah. something's different <laughs> show off my current glasses set up because I've, I've suffered with them this is my only pair of remaining glasses missing one oh. lens and uh oh, no. one one arm <laughs> so wait why why is the one the lens that's missing it's on the opposite side of the arm. I couldn't tell you <laughs> oh it's because this part's broken too if you see it actually oh yeah. goodness the whole thing. <laughs> oh, those poor glasses. Yeah, we're still in um we're still in a uh, very hard lockdown down here in Melbourne, so uh it's tough to go oh, out. Yeah. They're only taking emergency appointments and all that. Oh boy. Fun stuff. Well then there's Amelia who's got like five hundred pairs of glasses. <laughs> uh so if any do break, yeah, so, look at that. Yeah. It's just wow. ridiculous. Got, like ridiculous look at this. I have like fifteen pairs. So you would <laughs> think <laughs> That one of these pairs would be on my desk, but no, it's a pretty cool be, setup. You would be wrong. I'm I'm sitting here with uh, six year old glasses on right now. Nice. Which the the prescription is virtually identical to what it was back then, so it's not horrible. And then I've got an older pair as well that uh, that I was using for three years before that, <laughs> and an older pair as well. Uh, that would probably hurt my brain if I oh, use them. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I like I, my I, super emergency backup pair. Yeah, I know people though that like they just keep replacing the lenses like in the same frames and they never get new ones. But I, I think I did do that on these ones. Not come to think like of it, them as a statement piece. Yeah, and by you know, I mean, I have a pair of rainbow colored ones. I have you know, I mean, some regular it's, boring it's, black ones. I have. It's 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 a good fashion choice. I enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Now that we're all glassed up, um, <laughs> let's go ahead. We'll give a five count of silence. Uh, I'm going to stop for just a second. I've got forgot the backup recording. No there worries. Do you want to um? <laughs> do, do you want to retake any of the start or? No, you're you're no. perfectly fine. If if we do lose it for some reason, uh, we'll figure something out. Okay, I'm always happy right. to um send back a uh, another. I, I will or I will know uh shortly after we're done recording because I'm going to be editing it right away. Okay. Uh, so, side note: we do have the ABCs of Cthulhu uh, book for my kids, and they both love it. Really? Um, yeah, oh. we've we've read it to them <laughs> since they were like two years old, uh, and sometimes earlier, and they're just. Uh, and they've got a little uh, a Cthulhu plushie, like a little okay. green Cthulhu plushie. I mean, Cthulhu's so adorable, right? He is adorable when he's got these like big cartoon eyes mm-hmm. and like these little Great. squid. Great, so now you've taught your children to not be afraid of Cthulhu. Yeah, I mean, you might as well have a little less fear when a cosmic horror is coming down upon the world. <laughs> That's true. There's nothing you can do about it anyway. You might as well think, aw. Oh, look at Cthulhu. He's Just adorable. And then you happy know, thinking he's snuggly. He, he he might he might spare you, uh, thinking that he's uh, nice and cuddly. Exactly. You're the first person that really told him <laughs> that you think so. Exactly. That's all he needed. <laughs> That's all. <laughs>
I think so. On a non-show related note, I am going to go put this dog away because she is getting okay. into everything. Oh, lovely. <laughs> That's um, fine. I was going to try and like let her roam free, but she is not being responsible with that. So I will be right back. <laughs> no worries. Not a problem. Is this the kind of uh, kind of content you're after in general? Absolutely. Perfect. Yeah, this is perfect. All right. Just let me know if you want me to talk more or less or whatever. Absolutely. Uh, I'm I'm excited. Yeah, a bit of fun. So I have no idea what type of character I'm going to make, though. But we'll see. We'll see what the options yeah, are. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty open. Um, so you're U.S. Central. So you're in the middle of the U.S. Then. Yep. Uh, we we both are in Wisconsin. Oh, fantastic. Uh, which is uh, nestled uh, by the the leftmost uh, or the the westmost uh, Great Lakes. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. That's um. I've I've been to uh, Chicago and to Detroit. So that's as close as I've gotten. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, right north of Chicago is where we are uh, a bit. So, um, I think Amelia is about an hour and a half north of Chicago, and I'm about three, uh, three, uh, three and a half hours north. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, I'm in in Milwaukee. Milwaukee, yeah. yeah. Uh, there is a Chaos Zoom team member who lives in Milwaukee. Um, uh, yeah, oh, nice. yeah, Jim Lauder, who uh, is the uh, fiction line editor, amongst other things. Oh, that's Very cool. cool. Mm-hmm. Used to work for TSR. Ah, that would be why he's in Milwaukee. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> we're like right near Lake Geneva. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, which yeah. Is where TSR the was. birthplace of everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Scenic Lake Geneva. Somebody got really mad at me on Twitter because I was like, ooh, Scenic Lake Geneva. <laughs> and they were like, it's really nice there. And I was like, okay. <laughs> but it's still like right outside of like Kenosha and like this sort of like very like rust belt area of like you know yeah. factories that are empty and all that kind of stuff I'm like there's nothing to see in Lake Geneva <laughs> other than like a really nice shopping mall I, uh, there, there is a D20 they got very shrine offended is, at that <laughs> yeah I, I think there's a D20 shrine uh, near the Gygax uh, place oh uh, yeah uh, down in there definitely so. uh, yeah. yeah people people go there and bless their D20s uh, which is really hilarious that's great it's, yeah I, I really <laughs> don't know much about about American geography. I've been across the South, but that's about it. So I'll have to, well, maybe mm-hmm. not given your description of it, but I, one day I'll make it up there and I'll be able to confirm whether or not and get someone angry on There's Twitter a lot of nicer me. places in Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah I would not, uh, Lake Geneva would not be my top choice. Like, you can go there and bless your D20. It's at like four, 45 minutes ish north of Chicago. Um, but yeah, if you were going to go to Wisconsin, I don't think that would be on the top yeah, yeah. <laughs> list of places I would send you. <laughs> absolutely <sighs> recording that was a very like uh low energy countdown this time i feel well Not it's, sure, it's sure a, like it's weird because it's like a mid recording clicky instead of like a fresh like it's sunday morning let's do it that's this true is like it's sunday evening we're halfway through another recording we're gonna do this during a break well, i mean yeah this okay during the break that is the weird part yeah but we'll see what happens. All right. It's your second clicky of the day. You know, second usually clicky. cold open is like a first clicky, like fresh That's clicky. True. And this is, or, this is or a third clicky. That's um, true. Which is which is also exciting. And usually the second clicky with the guest here is it makes more sense. But you know, mm-hmm. I digress and I'm just wasting uh our break time. So Yeah. So hold on, I opened the one that says cold open. Yeah. But it's so like it a full sh- outline. It should be a full outline plus the cold open at the bottom. Oh, uh, Okay, I was expecting it to just be the cold open. It's cool. Nope. Uh, I I just uh, was lazy. Okay. I just did a, I did a copy and and uh, love whatever. a good copy paste. It's fine. Inst. So does does this character creation process, um, in terms of us actually applying the skills and stuff, go into the podcast as well? Just out of curiosity. Oh yeah. Oh hell mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, we we take care of all the we take out all the space, um, and all the uninteresting portions. But definitely the discussion about all of this uh, goes in. Excellent. Yeah, we we like to give a a nice, uh, you know, well presented raw experience of the character creation process. That's good. Hold on, I gotta find a one hundred. I for some reason only have, or I'll just do what I did before and decide which one's the tenth place. <laughs> Oh, no. After I roll. No, the red one is always the tens place, Ryan. The purple one is the one. Jeez, come on. Okay, well, it's not a matching set, but it's all right. Yeah, sparkly one and a rainbow one. Chaos, see you. What if I'm a MILF? 
Uh, <laughs> that's well, yeah, I, I don't think that there is a... So let me check the appendix for me. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Chaosium, <laughs> I would like... <laughs> All right. So now we can stop the Audacity recording. No. Nailed it. Nailed it. All right. We uh, did we it. Can, we, can, we can go ahead and stop. Well That's done. It. Hey. Well, I think I went up an octave there. Ooh. Yeah. That's new and exciting. I know. Um, I'm going to take a sip of this soda that I went to grab. I said, I have to grab something to drink. And did I drink it? No. What did I do? I ate a handful of pretzels, which is the opposite <laughs> of drinking something before we started recording. <laughs> yep. Uh, they were really that... good, though. They were cabin pretzels is what my aunt calls them. Oh, there you go. Um, uh, so you're re-thirstifying yourself. Right. But the, okay, so they're pretzels. You just like buy a bag of pretzels and then you get some of the like popcorn oil or whatever mm. um and you like put a little bit of that on there just enough to like kind of you know get them wet <laughs> <laughs> um but then you take a packet of like the ranch seasoning mm -hmm. and dump it in there and like mix it so then they're like ranch flavored pretzels oh bizarre they're so good like they're so addictive like oh, my kids and i in the mm. last like three days have eaten a whole bag of pretzels <laughs> it's really i'm not bad. a big fan of ranch seasoning but i can see the allure like if you do the same thing but maybe with like parmesan I'd be all over that. Like, maybe like a garlic uh, no, parmesan. No, you lost or... me at not ranch. <laughs> 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 you, you, you just, I, that's it. I can't. I'm sorry. Ranch is only for uh, wings. Uh, boneless, boneless. No, ranch is for wings. everything, Ryan. I, there I'm is gonna, nothing uh, that ranch is not for. If you would let me brush my teeth with ranch dressing, <laughs> I wouldn't do it. <laughs> oh, we're learning a lot uh, today about each other. <laughs> I love ranch. Eleanor is like that, though. She would like if you if you let her dip it in ranch, she will eat it. Yeah. Like like broccoli. She's like broccoli's great if it has ranch. And I'm like, yeah, that's fine. You're it not, doesn't take away the nutritional value. Right. Like ranch it, is not it, good for you, but it doesn't make the broccoli also not good. No, it, it just adds not good stuff into the good stuff. Right. But you're still getting the vitamins and stuff from I mean, the vegetables. That's fair. You're still, you still eating the, the vegetables. That's true. That's true. You just get, you know, other stuff too. Stuff that's, uh, that's ranch. It's ranch. <laughs> and, I don't know. Honestly, I think that like ranch could be its own food group and I would be it, okay it, with that. It kind of is. It's just this like creamy, uh, thing that, that the people either dip or pour onto things. Okay. So the question is then like, what are your thoughts on mayonnaise? Uh, mayo is, uh, the devil's salad dressing, um, and, uh, Miracle Whip is highly superior. Oh, no, <laughs> no. Get, you know what? Like we, we are very different people, right? Like we are, we are very different people. We, we, we have managed the to make this podcast work until now. Until now. When you have until crossed now. a line. Turn down the gauntlet. You have crossed uh, a line, right? Okay. To be fair. Um, I will eat mayo if it's the only option. I I don't snub my nose at it mm -mm. in terms of like mm -mm. it's inedible. Uh, but Miracle Whip is just better. It's it's tangy. It's got a nice no. whip to it. I don't want it's tangy. Smooth. No, like the point of mayonnaise is to like lubricate my sandwich. <laughs> right. Well, that that's what mayo. That's what uh, Miracle Whip does. I don't need it to have like does. a tangy flavor though. Like, oh, I don't it gives want it. Gives such a nice. I don't little... want it tangy. I just want it wet. <laughs> I mean, I've, that's fair, but like the, the thing that turns, okay. The thing that turns me off to Mayo, uh, last sidetrack on this, uh, when you scoop it, it's like, I don't know the consistency. It's like gelled. It's like, it's like scooping into jello. In mayonnaise? Yeah. It's because it's like an a, emulsion. Like a fresh, I know it's weird. It's supposed to be like that. It's weird. I want, I want more of like a, like a smooth peanut butter thing instead of, uh, it's eggs. It's eggs. Yeah, yeah, if you wanted peanut butter, then you could put peanut butter on a sandwich, Ryan. It's mayonnaise. I know. Like, eat your peanut butter turkey sandwich somewhere else. <laughs> I don't know no. what's going on. No. <laughs> <laughs> I could just see Ashley standing behind you. Like, like ask her what she, how she feels about mayonnaise. Miracle Whip. Uh, she loves mayonnaise. Uh, she does not like Miracle Whip. See? And, and we're married. So if we can get along... <laughs> 
he's a Republican and I'm a Democrat. <laughs> she likes mayonnaise and I like Miracle Whip. <laughs> Opposites attract. Uh, I guess. I guess if you and Ashley can make it work, then you and I can make a podcast. That's I know. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, I like I like saving people's lives. You like raising people's lives. Yeah. From the dead. Yeah. So you just like to save them beforehand. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh see it's if they're both the same thing. Uh, it's just, just different no, different states. I like to let people live a long, full life mm-hmm. and then do my thing. Yeah. You you interrupt. <laughs> The process. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to give them that lawn full life, so they're more uh, more seasoned uh, for when they come to your plate. I just want them to be more seasoned <laughs> with ranch. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> ranch flavored corpses. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh, me- metaphorically. Metaphorically. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Ooh, uh, those rank, are words rank, I just said. Rank is the spice of life, apparently. <laughs> if you're in the Midwest, yeah. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> uh, welcome to our ranch talk. Uh, this is... <laughs> this uh, could be our talking nog. <laughs> 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 just our once a year talking ranch. Oh, uh, yeah. Just just talking ranch. Uh, I don't know. Should we do a cold open? <laughs> Let's do a cold <laughs> Oh, welcome to the six minutes of outtakes, everybody. Oh, it's God. fine. <laughs> <sighs> All right. So cold open. Uh, call to action. We got a review to read. Awesome. Um, and then we're all good. Ooh. All right. I'll give us a five count. Okay. Um, I don't even need my uh, my light on because I... I don't have uh, any decorations in here. Yeah, it looks really like I'm, I was trying to figure out like what was I was like something's not something's not right. right. It's it's not. I I only have my uh, my character creation cast banner on the door for sound suppression. Your bookshelves are empty. Bookshelves are all empty for the most part. I mean, I've got some some folders that didn't fit in the boxes that I had. Um, I do have a box down here though that's got like my. My swords and stuff, and your swords. I've got like these tiny little swords. Oh, um, there's. I was like, like I can't s- say that when I moved, I had a whole box of swords. It's like mm-hmm. a whole set of them. It's just like three little tiny swords. Uh, they're not. They're just plastic. They're. Not, I don't. Uh, they might be metal. That almost sounds metal. Huh. My, these swords are metal. Um, yeah, and just my decorations and stuff from the shelves. Yeah. To open. But yeah. Uh, end of an era. End of an era. Uh, this is the this is the last recording. This right here is the last right here, recording. Right, now? right here, right now, the last recording in this studio, uh, forever. Wow. Yeah, that's that's kind of uh, that's kind of heavy. I'm in my now third place of recording. <laughs> well, because okay, so for a while I was in the closet, and then yeah. I moved into like my room. So that was in the same. We we'll count that as the same place. Mm-hmm. And then I was at my parents' house, and then now I'm in my apartment. Yeah. So, yeah. But I never had like a dedicated like recording. No. Space other than the closet, which was my kids' playroom. Mm-hmm. So. Wow. Well, I know. I'm like Twilight. weirdly sad about this. Me too. It's it's uh, uh, an an emotional experience to leave this behind. Uh, it's the end of an era, um, and the beginning of uh, the unknown room quality of my my tonal voice at the next place. It'll be good though. It should be <clears throat> fine. Um, I mean, if I can get rid of your reverb, it's uh, yeah. it's pretty easy to I was do much of anything. Because I'm like I so like the way I have my computer is like I'm actually facing into the corner of my room. Yeah. Um. And so I was thinking I should maybe like put some like soundproofing. Like if I do mm-hmm. it like right behind my computer, that should probably, because that's the oh, direction that, would, that my that would, voice is going, right? That would deaden a lot. Yeah. Okay. I'll figure something out. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, cold you open. Now that we're nine minutes into this. Now we're nine minutes into it. <laughs> okay. Uh, wonderful. All right. Here we go. I'll give us a five count. Uh, last, last set of fingers from the sauna studio. 
tried really hard to be quiet. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> oh, Lord. And we're done. And all oh, the last recording to hit stop in the studio.